Connect Africa. Greetings everyone. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Connect Africa. This is a platform where we discuss African issues, be it social, economic, and political. It also connects Africans at home to the African diaspora and African diasporas to Africans at home. It also connects actually Africans to the biggest Pan-African organization to the African Union. Having said that, our topic for today is the controversies around the upcoming election of the African Union. And for this, we invited advocate Sarko Abebrese. He will be joining us uh, online from Ghana in a in, in few seconds. But in the meantime, if you like this video, please share to your friends, spread the word of Pan-Africanism globally. And also, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos. Thank you very much and stay tuned. Connect Africa. OK, greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to the show, Connect, okay. Connect Africa. Uh, today we have here our guest is advocate Sarfo Abebrese. I think I pronounced it uh, good or not. <laughs> Thank you for having you here. Uh, our topic uh, for today is uh, uh, on the controversies of the upcoming election of the African Union. Uh, which will be held in, at the end of this year or beginning of the next year, uh, uh, January, no, actually in the beginning of next year, 20, uh, January 2021. Uh, so just before that, I'd like to introduce our guest here uh, because he has an interesting uh, profile. Uh, Advocate Sarfo uh, Abebrese is, uh, he's a journalist by profession and also an attorney and counselor at law of the New York Supreme Court uh, and Ghana. But that uh, an event that happened in 2001, actually in a stadium in Accra during a match between two local uh, clubs in, in Ghana has changed everything for him, I think, from my view at least. There was a violence that actually was a cause to lose 127 of uh, lives of uh, Ghanaians. And at that moment, he was uh, visionary enough and he changed that misfortune to a purposeful uh, mission, which he established an organization called uh, Supporters Unions of uh, Ghana. Uh, now, this organization not only brought victims from both sides, but also it made the national team of the Ghana, the Black Stars, more stronger, and eventually the Black Star has made it to, to the World Cup final. Uh, now, he didn't stop there. He was really visionary. So what he did is he took that to the next level, and he established, uh, because he saw the enormous power that sport has in bringing people uh, together and especially in uniting the African people. And uh, he established an organization uh, called Coalition of uh, Supporters Un uh, Unions of uh, Africa. And that's an organization that he's representing today while speaking uh, uh, with us today. Now, in the beginning, I said, well, looking at your profile, wow, what, what a jump of profession from a, from a journalist to a lawyer. But I think they supplement each other. And, the, and your profile has really interwoven perfect, perfectly. The, the belief that you had in sport, in bringing people together, has made you to realize this big organization that advocate for African people, for their uh, unification. Uh, and also, you, as a, law, as, uh, as a lawyer, you can be uh, an effective uh, advocate of the cause that uh, you are uh, behind. Now, coming to our topic for today, meaning the controversies around the upcoming election of the African Union, just to make it clear for our viewers, uh, the African Union Commission held uh, an election every four years whereby it elects the chairperson of the institution and also eight commissioners, namely uh, peace and security, security political affairs, uh, infrastructure and uh, energy, um, 
rural economy and agriculture, science and technology, economic affairs and social affairs, if I'm not mistaken. So all these are elected every four years. What happened is just to give you a glimpse, the, the current chairperson, uh, Mohamed Musa Faki, uh, is going to rerun for uh, another four years in, to be in the office. That's not the problem, but the problem is the nominees that are supposed to be into this, uh, this election have somehow systematically to be out of it and he's going to go uh, unopposed, technically making him the only, uh, without any option, the only next chairperson of the, the institution. Now, my question is to start with to advocate Sarfo. Can we say that this biggest Pan-African institution or organization that we have in our continent, is it failing 1.3 billion of the African citizens? Is it closing that uh, hope or glimpse that we had a little de democracy or peaceful transitions here and there uh, throw out of the window and slam the door on us? What's your take? Uh, hi, I'm Mahlet Ayele. Um, thanks very much for having me. And uh, let me take the opportunity to say hello to um, the thousands of your viewers um, in Africa, in Europe, and all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, greetings to everybody. And, um, you know, let's, uh, let's still have hope in Africa. Let's still hope in Africa because um, this is the continent that we have. This is what the Almighty gave us. This is where he placed us. And this is where he planted 43% of the world's uh, resources in for us to take charge of and to make it benefit ourselves and posterity. So definitely we cannot give up on the continent. And if we cannot give up on the continent, then we can also give up on the African Union. Because the African Union, whether we like it or not for now, mm -hmm. that is the biggest political authority uh, for the continent of Africa. And that is our hope for the future. So yes, um, you are right in the semis that you gave about the problem that we're having with the African Union now. We're gonna have the elections in um, next year in January and February. Um, by this time in February, I think the results uh, would have been out and would have known who is running the continent for another four years. But of course, the sad thing is that we even don't need, that, as things stand now, we even don't need to wait that long before we know who's running the affairs of the continent. Because we have a chairperson that has done the job for four years, uh, four years that many, many people on this continent of Africa will tell you um, was much of a, a failure. Uh, still wanting to run for another four years and guess what? He's running unopposed. So nobody is challenging him. And so that means that no matter what happens at the elections, if nothing happens now, we're still going to have Faki Mahamat doing eight years as the, the, the leader of Africa, as the chairperson of the African Union Commission. And that is what we see to be an affront to the dignity of the continent of Africa. That is what we see to be also um, a slap in the face of democratic rule in this, uh, on this continent. And that is why my organization, COSWA, uh, we are crying out loud that, hey, let's get something done. We are asking for the African Union elections to be postponed, if for nothing at all, on the basis of democracy. And guess what? We do have precedence on our side. We have precedence in the sense that uh, we all know that whoever is the leader of the African Union Commission is virtually the president of Africa. Mm -hmm. We have the 55 heads of states of the various African countries coming together to vote, mm -hmm. to select the one that should head the African Union Commission. So if the 55 heads of states of Africa vote for you, you become the head of Africa. For the four years, you are the one that is running the affairs of the continent in every way possible and conceivable. Now, if we have a situation where any country, in any country, we're having a lot of uh, passports now in uh, La Côte d'Ivoire, in Mali, in uh, you know Guinea, and other places. We expect that the African Union Commission chairperson should have the guts and the temerity and the moral um, responsibility 
to be, to be able to intervene. Let's imagine for a second that in any of these countries, the incumbent has run the four, five years or six years in some places. And at the end of the tenure, he wants to go for another term. No problems with that. But if he wants to run at a point where there won't be any opposition in that country, would Faki Muhammad sit down or call up and say, hey, what you're doing in your country is not democratic. So please allow for free and fair elections and allow for participatory democracy and let people that want to run, let them run. That is exactly what we're talking about. If it happens in any country, it will not be right. Then it will not be right if it is happening at the African Union uh, uh, headquarters itself. Mm -hmm. Now, come to think of it, four years ago, and that is where we talk about precedence, in 2016, we had a similar situation. And that wasn't as dicey as this one. We had a situation where the African Union Commission chairperson, Madam Zuma from South Africa, wasn't running for another four years. After the four years, she said, okay, I'm okay, I've done what I came to do. I'm not running again. But hey, let's file nominations. As at this time, we had three nominations that had been filed for the chairperson position. And Madam Zuma, in her supreme wisdom, felt that no, three is not representative enough. We have five regions in Africa. Wait a minute, we cannot go ahead and have the elections with only three candidates for the chairperson. So come on, let's postpone and let's encourage other people to come in. So Madam Zuma postponed the election and she reopened the nominations. And two more people came in and guess what? The last person to come in is the current chairperson, Fakir Musa Muhammad. He came in as a fifth candidate and he came in in December of 2016, after the normal nominations would have been closed. He came in through the back door. He had to struggle to uh, uh, reruns of the elections. At the end of the day, he won, and he became the chairperson. Now, four years fast forward, we have a situation where only one candidate being himself, and he thinks and wants all of us to believe that one candidate is enough, and that we should go ahead and have the elections mm -hmm. with only one candidate. If three wasn't enough, how can one be enough? This is what we, we cannot understand. And this is what we cannot even accept that 55 heads of states that are going to do the voting are not seeing anything wrong with this. Mm -hmm. It is it, our imagination, it is our understanding. If three wasn't enough, now one is enough and that one should still go ahead and run on the post and take Africa into the debt for another four years? Hell no. That is why we are crying out loud, my sister. I, I, hear, I hear your really very interesting stories and, and how ironical enough for, uh, you know, for him or for the institution to say that uh, one is enough. And even those uh, hardly who were true, who filed their application and who were, who were put out, we will talk about some yeah, that's very ironical. Connect Africa! While yeah. your organization and others are rallying behind this code to postpone uh, the election and hopefully for other nominees to be, uh, to, to be in it, but how can we be, we, we be sure, you know, normally if, I, if I'm mistaken, um, you, you correct me. Normally what happens is uh, organize, uh, countries who nominate for the chairperson, you know, so, uh, bring and like the regional blocks together, nominate one person per region. Or is it every yeah. country? Yes, it's per regional. So the five regions do that. So what we have is Central Africa, of course, it's, it's, it's uh, his own playground. So perhaps they are backing him. Uh, but North yeah. Africa, we have a situation that North Africa and Eastern Africa, they, <laughs> strangely, the, 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 there is no nominee. And uh, Southern Africa, I would, I would leave it for you to elaborate on it, which they tried one and it failed, and from West Africa as well. Uh, but how did that happen? How those two blocks having, you know, many countries under them, 
fail to do so. Can we say that? Because it also shows it's like a reputation. I don't know the history of how these elections happen and how the nomination are coming in, but the last election by itself tells us that there were only three nominees and then with the, extend, with the extended time, that's how uh, other two nominees, including uh, uh, Musa Faki, came into the picture. Are we short of people who qualify for the position? What is going on? What, what, there is a mystery behind this, certainly, that really one has to unveil it. How come those countries keep their mouths shut and say, we have no nominees. Isn't this really joking on the qualified people that they have in their own country? Uh, and also, maybe is it high time, can we say that, for the AU to give a, a privilege and a benefit and with all the obligation and duties that come with it for the sixth region, for the African diaspora? What, what, what do you say on this? Well, that, that is a loaded uh, two-pronged two question. Let me take the first one, because the answer to that is a very long one. And even with that one, we can only surmise we don't have, you know, definite, definite answers. Um, why is it that for the chairmanship, we have only one candidate and nobody came up? Mm -hmm. First of all, let's look at it this way. Are we to believe? that the citizens of Africa, the, the many, many thousands of qualified and efficient, you know, administrators and politicians and ambassadors and all that, are not interested in African Union elections? Is that what it is, it is supposed to be? Hmm. The answer to that question is very easy to find. At the course of nominations, you know, last month, we had as many as 18 candidates filing for one position in some of the commissioner slots that you mentioned. Some of them had 15, some of them had 18, uh, some had 10, 12. In fact, the list that we had was for the deputy chairperson position, and that was eight candidates. If you go through that, what that tells you is that we're not seeing an apathetic uh, African intelligentsia that is not interested in the African Union election. If we could get so many file, filings, you know, in so many of the categories, that tells you that the, the African Union elections is a very popular one and people are interested in serving the continent of Africa. So that brings us to the question, if you could have as many as 18, 17, 16 candidates filing for even commissioner positions, Mm -hmm. How come that at the close of nominations, there was only one candidate standing for the chairperson position? Mm -hmm. So we can conveniently discount the possibility of people not being interested. People were interested. So how did it end up in a, a situation where there was only one man standing at the end of the day? And I will tell you that from the, the, the position that we are, and I'm talking on behalf of my organization, COSWA, mm -hmm. which of course is a partner to the African Union. That is the one that gives us the voice for us to be able to um, uh, have a say in the African Union elections. We signed a partnership agreement with African Union on the 5th of April, 2018. And by virtue of that, we have a voice in what happened. And our take is that a systematic plan was put in place to make sure that nobody that wanted to run for the position of chairperson would get a chance to do so. We had a mafioso work that we believe informed the situation whereby by close of nominations, there was only one man standing. Why do we say so? Let's go back um, about two, three months ago. Mm -hmm. We have a situation where we have a Ghanaian that is currently the vice uh, chairman, uh, or if you like, the de deputy chairperson, to be politically correct, we say deputy chairperson of the African Union. His name is Mr. Kwesi Koti, I know an him. excellent diplomat. Yeah. He spent all his life as an ambassador for Ghana, and he was even Ghana's ambassador to the African Union. And he has worked as a deputy foreign minister in Ghana and in so many I mean, positions. 
And this gentleman, at the same time that Fakim Muhammad was running for chairperson, he was also running for deputy chairperson. But look at the contrast. Fakim Muhammad ran against four other candidates, and he had to go for three real rounds before he won. Kwesi Korte ran against six, uh, five other candidates for the deputy chairperson position, and he won outright with 45 of the 55 votes right away. Hmm. 55 African heads of states voted, 45 of them voted for Kwesi Korte right away. For the past been there, they will go through them now. So at the time when Faki Muhammad showed the true colors of himself, that he's not sitting there as the, the number one man for Africa and sitting there for Africa, but he's rather there for the interest of a foreign superpower, being France. Because guess what? When Madame Arikana Chihombo Rikwao made that discovery of the billions of dollars that France was siphoning from African countries, Faki Muhammad didn't take kindly to that. And on the orders of France, he fired Arikana. Everybody in Africa was outraged. Faki stuck to his guns. And so at the end of the four years, what we really wanted was a situation where the deputy chairperson will rise to the occasion and run against, you know, the chairperson who has obviously failed we the citizens of Africa. Everybody knows this. Yeah. But what happened when Kwesi Korte was prevailed upon by the masses and the people in the streets, including myself, including Madame Marikana Chiyombori, everybody was supporting him to run for, for, for the chairmanship. Mm -hmm. Eventually, Kwesi Korte was betrayed. Let me put that, let me put it that way by his own country, Ghana, hmm. by the authorities in Ghana. That, that is the bad truth. Because what happened? Kwesi Korte put in the, 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 the application. My organization engaged the government of Ghana, the presidency. We asked for you know, a meeting with the Ghana government to, to, to talk to them about what is at stake in, the, in Africa and the reason why we needed the deputy to take over. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, as I, even as I talk to you now, mm -hmm. the recording of our meeting with the government of Ghana, we, as an organization, that, is, that was born in Ghana. We don't have a copy of that, of that, um, of that meeting. At the end of the day, Kwesi Korte himself had to come to Ghana to, to meet with the, with the government. And the first very embarrassing sign that we got was for Kwesi Korte to be told that yes, you are coming to your homeland, but at the end of the day, the borders are closed because of COVID. So hey, you, you can only fly to um, Togo and then you know come in by road into your own country. Fair enough, COVID. But at that same time, the Kwesi Korte was trudging through the forest in Togo to arrive in Ghana. Fahim Muhammad landed his jet at the airport in Accra. Can you believe that? No. And so both of them were in Ghana at the same time. The one that is from Ghana had so, to come through the pool. I don't want to interrupt, but, uh, but it's so interesting. Why was uh, uh, His Excellency Kwesi and the chairperson are arriving at the same time in Accra? Why was that? I know that Kwesi was called, his excellency Kwesi was called, but the, the chairperson, why he was coming to Ghana? Well, we gathered that according to him, he was coming to Ghana ahead of the inauguration of the AFCTA, okay. which, which Ghana was going to host. But of course, that wasn't, that was ahead of the inauguration. So Okay. It wasn't announced. There was no a public listening that the chairperson of the African Union was in the country. We picked it up from our own intelligence on the ground. Now, that wasn't all. Kwesi Korte is in Ghana, and, you know, my organization, all the people are excited about him being here. Now we're going to know exactly what is going to happen with the bid to run for the chairmanship. And then we get the shock of our lives 
when on the deadline day for ECOWAS, and of course, at this point, all the other African, West African countries were waiting on Ghana. Yeah. Nobody found the nomination from any of the West African countries because everybody knew that Kwesi Korte was going to be nominated from Ghana to run. On the deadline day, Ghana government tells us that no, we're not nominating Kwesi Korte. Hmm. We're rather nominating another Ghanaian to go and run against Faki Muhammad for the position. And that was just two hours before the deadline. And guess what? We get the name Mr. Dr. Mohamed Ibn Chambas, another excellent diplomat, you know, very good in everything, another, um, you know, supporter of the COSWA project for African unity, mm -hmm. when he was the chairman of ECOWAS. Mm -hmm. uh, he also gave us uh, ECOWAS's mandate to run this, uh, our organization, somebody we, are, we respect and love so much. Mm -hmm. But guess what? Within 48 hours after uh, Kwesi Korte being ditched for Mohammed Ibn Chambas, we get another shot. Chambas makes a U-turn and announces to the whole Ghana, to the whole West Africa, that I'm not running. After the nomination, I went and consulted Chad. I went and consulted Faki Mahamat. And after the consultation, I'm not running. I think he should go all alone. And that was a big shot. But even bigger shock was for us to also learn that the time for the official unveiling, the official inauguration of the AFCTA comes. And everybody knows that the thing is being done in Ghana. Yeah. We have an assembly of all the top people in Ghana to do the inauguration. And Kwesi Korte was here in Ghana. I can affirm that personally. Mm -hmm. And Kwesi Kote wasn't invited because Faki Muhammad was there. The government of Ghana failed to invite Kwesi Kote. What in and is going on with Ghana? Really? I mean, you, it's, it's just blowing my mind right now, really. What? That, 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 is, that, that is a shock. That was a shock because for, for the AFCTA to be unveiled and inaugurated in Ghana and, and Faki Muhammad comes back to Ghana, and he's the one that the government hands over the keys to and everything, and Kwesi Korte was not invited. So that was for Ghana, the Ghana nation to tell Kwesi Korte that, look, we're not only nominating you to challenge this guy, but we are rather even preferring, you know, him as a son of the soil of Ghana to you, who rather is, you know, Kwesi Korte is 1,000% a Ghanaian. Yeah. That was painful. That was excruciating. That was a slap in the face. And that is what enabled Faki Muhammad now to get back on his feet and get to other African countries and tell them, well, Ghana was the one that we were all uh, thinking that they were going to run against me. Now the rest, everybody was shell-shocked all over Africa when this thing happened. And we are yet to get any answers from the government of Ghana as to why Kwesi Korte was treated like that in his own country, Ghana. And what, what makes it even more, you know, unbelievable is that this whole thing, AFCTA thing, was the brainchild of Kwesi Korte himself. That was way back eight years ago when he was Ghana's ambassador to Ethiopia, to the African Union. Mm -hmm. When he mooted the idea when the, the Kwame Nkrumah's uh, statue was unveiled in Addis Ababa, mm -hmm. and the then president, Ata John Atamils, you know, attended with the, with the children of Kwame Nkrumah. That was when Kwame Nkrumah mooted the, uh, this idea for President Atamils to ask for the AFCTA to be hosted in Accra, Ghana. And he has worked all his life for the past eight years to get this done in Ghana. How come that on the day of inauguration, and he himself is here in the country. The government officials, he had met with the Minister for Foreign Affairs, so they knew he was here in Ghana. How on earth could they go ahead with the unveiling of the ASCTA and tell him, no, you cannot be here on the days because Fakim Mahamat is here with us, so you cannot come in. Hmm. So that was the strongest message that went around the 
circles to the rest of the country that, hey, maybe something bigger than what any of us can, can look at or think of exactly. is happening. Exactly. And that exactly. anybody that dares to write Anybody that dares to, you know, raise a head against Fakir Muhammad is going to get his head chopped off. Yeah. If the deputy chairman himself could be treated this way by his own country, Ghana, then we have something bigger than what we were expecting. And that proved to be true. We had a situation where the nominations, you know, went on to the other, other parts of Africa and each part that it went to, any aspirant that would want to uh, uh, come, come up, we had a similar situation. The biggest of all, the biggest of all, my sister, was Madame Arikana Chihombo Ripao herself. Yeah. Because we all know millions of people took to social media to demonstrate against, you know, her sacking by Fatima Hamad on the orders of France. Yeah. So we reached out to her after, you know, Pesicote was sidelined. And we got to her and said, no, our sister, come back to Africa and come and help out because things are falling apart now. Connect Africa! It's uh, just blowing my mind what happened to this nation. And no wonder actually the strongest advocacy is coming out from Ghana because a lot is happening in Ghana itself. Exactly. A and whole lot happened. We are, still, we are still here to unravel the mystery behind how the government of Ghana could do that to its own citizen that was perfectly placed. Everybody was looking up to Ghana. Everybody yes. was looking because up to Ghana. Because two of the people saving. happened yes. to be uh, coming from Ghana, meaning uh, His Excellency Kwase, uh, Kwase Kwate and also uh, with by marriage, uh, Ambassador or Dr. Arikana is also Ghanaian by marriage. I'm not sure if she's holding a Ghanaian passport, but I think by marriage she's Ghanaian. And, yes, uh, she's, holding, just, she's holding a Ghanaian passport. And, and you know, yeah. she was ambassador, African Union ambassador to the United States yeah. on her Ghanaian passport. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't know that. Uh, just for, for our viewers. Okay. To make it to make it clear, just to say, you, you will continue about the Dr. Arikana, just to give them a little background. Dr. Arikana Chiombori is at she was the former ambassador of the African Union to the United States. For me, actually, personally, she is uh, the female incarnation of our great people, Pan Africans like Thomas Sankara, like um, uh, Patrice Lumumba of this time, actually, the only person who can, who can tell the colonial powers like it is with no apologetic publicly. And that person, after telling France to stay away from its previous colonies in Africa, in West Africa, in two months' time, she yeah. was... Uh, she, she was fired, I think I can say, by this current elect chairperson of the African Union. Embarrassing enough. Now, please, yeah, um, you can go on and uh, tell us, uh, like, what happened? Okay. How did you... So, we fall back and we appeal to Madame Maricana to tell her that, well, we thank you for supporting your brother, um, Excellency Kwesi Korte. But this is what has happened, and we cannot place a finger on anything. So why don't you step into the fray yourself? Why don't you come back as uh, Mama Africa and come and save the continent? So my organization, again, engaged her, had a series of um, online meetings with her, and she said, OK, I will, I will respond to the cry of the people of Africa, and I will come in and get the nomination, and I will run for the leadership of the African Union Commission against my former boss who fired me, that is Fatih Muhammad. And we were all excited. And as the days ran by, because the, the deadline for nomination for West Africa had already passed, but the one for Central and uh, Western and, uh, uh, sorry, not Western, Eastern, South Africa was still on. 
And we understood that the country of Zimbabwe, which is the, the motherland of Arikana's the Chigobo Ripao, mm -hmm. was in agreement, you know, and Kozwa Zimbabwe, you know, the Zimbabwean branch of our organization had also uh, massed up support for her. And we were expecting that, okay, at long last, we're going to have, you know, some form of um, democratic run at the AU chairperson, chairperson position. Only for us to realize again on the, on the last day that Zimbabwe's attempt to nominate Her Excellency, you know, had also been, been chalked up by the current and sitting African Union chairman. Now, when we say African Union chairman, um, listeners and viewers have to understand this. Okay, so what I, when we talk about the African Union chairman, we are talking of the African state that for that one year is the ceremonial chairman of the African Union. Okay, so the, currently, Mr. Sarah Ramaphosa, the president of Africa, is the chairman of the African Union. Yeah. He has been the chairman for one year. Worry. The next term is going to be the the, the president Congo. of um, Congo PLC. Yeah, uh, uh, going to be the next chairman. So it goes for one year, one year, one year. Now we understand that the president of Zimbabwe wants to dominate um, Arikana, but um, finally we fell on Arikana Chiyombo Power. And we understand that the deadline for the also passed and Zimbabwe had not been allowed to put in the candidature of Arikana Chiyombo Rikwao because the rest of SADC heads of states were of the opinion that Faki Muhammad should run on the post. Hmm. And that was the final name. echelon of African politics. Because with that, it meant that nominations had been closed and that nobody could come up again to say, I am running. So African Union Commission came out. And again, let me, let me emphasize the difference. Anytime you hear African Union, but you don't hear the commission, we are talking of the ceremonial uh, country presidents. But when you hear the African Union Commission, Chairman, we are talking of the real power broker. We're talking of Faki Mahama. We're mm -hmm. talking of the guy that runs for four years okay. and controls everything in Africa. Okay. So the election for the African Union Commission chairman, chairmanship comes to a close and there was no nomination from any African country to run against Faki Mahama. This is unprecedented. It's never happened in the history of Africa. Since the OAU was started in 1963, it metamorphosed into the AU in 1999. For all these 57 years, there has never been a situation where we are going for elections and the chairman is running on a post. So we came up and said, wait a minute, this is not democracy. This is not what we want to see in Africa. We want democratic principles to prevail on this continent of Africa. We cannot be a laughing stock to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. But something that happens even in the individual countries, it cannot happen. Even in the individual countries of Africa. Yes, we have situations of elections being rigged and oppositions being manhandled and all that. But no, none of the, even the, 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 the biggest despot, <laughs> in any of the African countries can, can dream of saying that elections come up and I don't want anybody to run against me. So I'm the only face on the ballot paper. My question is this, all these 55 heads of states that are, have closed up their ears and they don't want us to talk about this situation. If any of them 
had that situation coming up. Let's say that whichever one, okay, at the time you were running to be president in your country in Africa, let's say that at that time, your opponent had blocked everything and said that nobody should run against me. Would you have agreed to that in your own country? That is the question we should ask all of them. Exactly. That is the question they have to answer to the people of Africa. Would they have accepted that they want to run against that certain president four, ten, eight years ago before they became the president heads of says now? If that president or that head of state at that time had done what we are seeing or, or what, what we are experiencing now at the AU headquarters now. That no, no opponent, no candidate, I'm the only one. My face will be the only one on the ballot paper. Would they have accepted? Would they have agreed? Now, if they couldn't have agreed to it in their own countries, why should they expect us to agree to that at the helm of continental politics at the moment? Why should they tell us that, well, that is okay, all of us are agreed that he should run for another, another four-year term? Why, do they, why, why, why would they, for once, even think of it? That is what we don't, we don't get, what it is. But, but that, what don't you it? think, but because the African, the African Union is uh, it's an intergovernmental organization, it's not like exactly the European Union that can tell heads of states, hey, you are doing wrong, do this and do that. It's just their little uh, playground that they, they do what they want to do. They are actually... Uh, the one who are, I, in, in my opinion, who are ordering uh, the, the, the chairperson, not really him. I, I really don't think he, he has that much of the power. Of course, in this case, they lended him the power. But here is the thing. Uh, definitely, there is a much bigger issue behind all this. That's for sure. That, that make our leaders shut their mouths and then just see, perhaps they are supporting what's happening, that how come that every 55 states are supporting, it's just impossible. And then the incident that you brought, like the, for uh, His Excellency Kwesi to get 45 votes out of 55, that also tells you a different thing. So, yeah, there, there, there is something, and uh, uh, I hope there will be a tale it of all book or interview after all this that will that will tell us to to uh, to understand what's exactly going on. Uh, we will be uh, right back after this break. <laughs> First, I, okay. I want to share this with my viewers, actually. Uh, I was working, like, I, I am a Pan-African person ever since my childhood. And right after college, I established this uh, non-governmental Af uh, non organization called African Youth Association, the first of its kind in Ethiopia at that time. And we were working on values of the Pan-Africanism and different things, actually, also the then Organization of African Unity and then African Union. Now, and I also worked with organizations that are affiliated with the African Union uh, and as a Latin officer for a couple of them. And also the last two years before I left Ethiopia, actually, I was working inside the African Union itself. I was an employee. Now, I haven't seen an organization really in my life that is such a mess and disorganized. And on top of it, it's full of, really, it's full of people who are only worried about to fill their pocket with the hard currency that they are getting financed by the colonial powers and bringing also their colonial vestige to this biggest Pan-African institution and dividing Anglophone and Francophone. It's just baffling and disgusting. Seriously, if you are really a Pan-African person, you, can't, you just can't stand working in that organization. It's, it's just impossible. And uh, now 
I want to bring you uh, in March 2020, the Mail and the Guardian uh, has uh, leaked the memo that was uh, written from the, uh, by the African Union Staff uh, Association to the chairperson himself and, uh, you know, telling him actually, which is kudos to them, really. Like I said, wow, okay, there are such people to tell what they feel in the organization. And uh, in this um, article, they included that actually they quote, it says a mafia style leadership in that organization. And that it, the, 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 um, the, the Mohammed Musa Faki is failing this organization under his leadership and there's corruption and there are other things, appointments of people without following the right procedure. Now, in your view and with your organization, because you have a memorandum of understanding with the African Union and uh, obviously you are operating from the headquarter itself. And what makes you, what are the basis for you to say uh, Musa Faki is incompetent to rerun the coming election because it has to be clear uh, for, for the for, for the for the viewers. And then, um, yeah, what what are the basis uh, for you? I think that by itself uh, might take a lot of time. Okay, if we say if we say that Faki Mahamat is incompetent, we're not talking of competence in terms of his. Um, uh, ability to stand as uh, a candidate for the elections. He is competent to stand as a candidate for the elections, just as everybody has that competence, that right to, to, to stand, run for office, okay, mm -hmm. as a candidate. Mm -hmm. We are saying that let other people also have that right, that competence to also run. Let's see a democratic run of the elections. Not that one person is the only one standing and nobody can run against him. Because if we do that, we are eroding the very basic principles of democratic rule that Africa so much needs. You made a point that if a situation like that arises in any other African country, would the African Union chairperson have the moral right and courage to call that country to order? Definitely no. No, yeah. So the biggest, the best example for democratic rule should be set by the leadership of the African Union itself. And that is why we are saying that this election, so far as it concerns the, the chairmanship, is going to be a ruse. And so we should get it postponed and reopen the nominations. And let us see how many people will come up and run. And then the heads of states, even now, you know, where it is still the 55 heads of states, if they still want to vote for Faki Mahama, let them do it in a democratic way. That is what we're saying. But we're looking at long-term plans, even to get, you know, amendments to the African Union Charter and all that. And this fight, as we keep saying, my organization will not stop it today or tomorrow until we get, we see the right things are being done and we have many other options that we will, we will approach and, and, and move to if the, I mean, come next month, the next month, and we are, they are still other month and they are not postponing the elections. We will, we will take this fight, you know, to whatever democratic and lawful limits that we can take it to. Very clear. And uh, that's, uh, at least we have one organization who stand behind the, uh, uh, the people of Africans, and really, I congratulate you for what you are doing. Now, we take a, uh, a break, and when we come back, we will talk with, we will continue our, our discussion with Ambassador Sar um, Advocate Sarpo uh, on what is right now being done by his organization, what are the progresses, because uh, the, his organization have launched uh, this uh, uh, advocacy uh, two months ago, if I'm not mistaken, so we will, he will give us an update on that. Connect Africa! So, yeah, um, Advocate Sarpo, I know that let's talk about now what your organization is doing actually practically as we speak. 
I know that uh, you have launched a, pe a petition to be signed by uh, globally uh, to the African citizens. Uh, and also you have sent out official letters to each 55 countries to the head of states through their embassies in Accra and in Addis Ababa. Now, what is the progress looks like? What is the reaction? What do we have right now? Yeah, okay. So um, what our organization decided to do was to do, as you said, a global launch a global campaign mm -hmm. on avaz.org. You know, avaz.org is one of the biggest um, online platforms for petitions and campaigns mm -hmm. uh, with over 400 million membership, mm -hmm. you know, online. So we launched with them and uh, it was a very, very successful um, program because uh, we managed to hit um, more than 28 million signatures for people that all over the world are supporting our plea okay. for the African Union elections to be postponed. And so far, we're not getting any official response from any of the leaders or from the African Union itself. But we are not giving up because that, eight, that 28 million uh, signatures that we got made us to know and believe that we are on the right course made us to know and believe that we are speaking for the 1.3 billion people of Africa and over 300 million of Africans in the diaspora. And that we cannot give up on this course. So we are moving ahead. We have a lot of plans that we will not even want to talk about now, but we have a lot of, you know, Africa uh, in, in governance, we have three arms of government. We have the executive. We mm -hmm. also have the judiciary and we also have the legislature. And mm -hmm. with the African Union, yes, we are now pummeling on the doors of the executive and asking the African Union Commission to listen to us and just to postpone the elections and get the right things done. If it stays like this and they still want to go ahead with the elections, we would then appeal to the other arms of government. government. That is the legislature that is the African Union Parliament in South Africa. And if that fails, we would then look at a possibility of going to the African Union court, you know, in Arusha, Tanzania, yeah. and getting an order of an injunction to place on the elections. We, we, we need to emphasize this. We are doing everything democratically and by the rule of law. We are not taking to the streets to take the law into our own hands and do anything that would damage the already sunken image of Africa in this matter. We are very, very law-abiding citizens of the continent of Africa. My organization, we have a lot of lawyers and a lot of, you know, law-abiding people at the helm of affairs in, in this organization. So we are democratic and we want to see democracy prevailing. And we believe that this course will yield the needed results. Not even if not for this term, we would have established a situation where for people cannot take Africa for a ride the way we are taking for a ride. We need to at the starting point is now. All Africans of Africa in Africa. Don't lose hope in Africa. Stand with us and let's push ahead because the cause that we're fighting for is a right cause and yeah. it will definitely yield the desired results and emancipate Africa from the colonial powers that still want to control us and make us such a laughing stock. You know, to see that Africa has come of age and we will do what it takes to be able to, you know, make Africa what Africa has to be. Yeah, yeah. And so with the other question, issue that ah, you okay. raised about Madame Americana, yes, yeah, about Madame Americana, we're sending a message to her. She should still stand strong. It's, she's gone through a whole lot from the time that she made that discovery against France, siphoning these billions of dollars from Africa until now. A lot has gone on. We thank God for her life that she's still alive you know, and she's still up and doing and she's still 
hasn't given up on the continent of Africa. We are in support of her, definitely. Yeah. And we do believe that the God that has made her who she is and that created her to be an African will still continue to be with her and what is destined to happen will happen. It's the same message that we also send in to His Excellency Kwesikorte, to the likes of uh, P. Elo Lumumba and other Pan-African stalwarts that are standing with us shoulder to shoulder to push on this fight. Nobody so should... Practically, with these 20, over 28 million uh, signatures that are gathered, it, uh, is Koswa able to, not Koswa, but everyone that's standing with you, is it able to make the African Union to postpone the election time? What, what is needed? More? Yes, that is, you see, that is, the, that is the demonstration of power to let them know that if 28 million people across all over the world can tell you that what you are doing is wrong, so postpone, listen to these people and postpone. That is something they should take into consideration. Mm. But hey, you, you have a situation where, look at what happened. Where, I mean, all these 55 countries could take that decision to, to, obvio, to make something that is so wrong happen. It happened earlier on when, when Arikana Chiyombo was sacked. Millions of people signed petitions yeah. and asked for her reinstatement. They were still adamant. So what we are saying is that they can continue, they can continue to be adamant and ignore the, the voices of the 28 million people, but we are not going to stop. We are not going to stop. We need, some of us have invested too much in, in Africa. Yeah. I should be sitting in New York and practicing my law there and making I mean, thousands of dollars, you know, yeah. every day. Yeah. Yes, but I'm here in Africa and working the trenches and doing what has to be done to try and build up African unity and African integration and everything. And that is a cause that some of us have decided to, to, to go by. Yeah. And we will not put all this energy into Africa and want to sit down and see things happening the way that they are happening. That is why we are speaking out and that is why we are urging everybody that believes he's African to join forces with us and let's get the right thing done and let's get this continent back on its feet. Uh, so yeah, my questions are also uh, from now, it is, they are very practical. So are you planning uh, or is there a plan for uh, uh, um, Dr. Arikana and also His Excellency Kwesi Kwarte uh, if it is postponed to become a, a contestant again? Yes, we, we will. We, we will. Yeah, def, is that, that is definite. Both of okay. them, okay. Both, either of them, we believe either of them will get the nod of the people of Africa okay. as a true exactly. leader. They have demonstrated that. And, and we are saying that not only them, but we want a level playing field. So maybe up to five candidates can come up and then we can have a real election. Let them tell the people of Africa what they aspire to do, what they, want, they know they can do for the continent of Africa, build African unity, progress, eliminate corruption, and a whole lot of things that, are, that is sinking this continent of Africa all over. That is what we want to see. So yes, if Kwesi Kote comes up, we'll support him. If Arikana comes up, we'll support her. If so PLO Lumumba comes up, we'll support him. So it we all want depends the on, the, on their personal decision to be in it or not. Uh, which one of them? All of them, are like uh, the, uh, Dr. Arikana, uh, His Excellency Kwesi, and also Lumumba. It, 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 you are waiting only on their personal decision, or they, like they're, okay, they decided if postponed, I will be in it. Where are they well, right now? First of, all, first of all, we need the nominations to be reopened. To we be need the, if the door is shut, you, you, you cannot go wake up these, uh, I mean, <laughs> these people to tell them come in and, and, and let's run because the door is shut against them. So what we're doing first of all is to push for the postponement of the elections and the, and the reopening of, of the nomination. Once that is done, you know, we, we definitely, we know that definitely a lot of people, very credible 
candidates will come up. And then we can have a very, you know, good run of elections to, to get the right people in, 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 in position. Hmm. For how long is the post parliament? Like six months or three months? For how long you're planning to, for the... Yeah, we are asking for at least a three month, uh, sorry, at least a, a six month post parliament. Okay. Because in 2016, that is what happened. The election was postponed. That is how come we, we held the elections was held in, in February, you know, of the of the following year. Mm -hmm. And that was because three candidates wasn't representative enough. So all that we're saying right now is hey, one candidate definitely cannot be representative enough if three wasn't representative enough, you know, four years ago. So the they should, they should give us the postponement and reopen the nominations and let's see democracy thrive in Africa. Mm -hmm. And we want to emphasize that my organization is doing this because we are a Pan-African organization. We are not doing this for any personal gain or anything from anybody yeah. involved in this. We are doing this on our own because we believe in Africa and we want Africa to be seen to be where it belongs to. And that is why we're, we're putting our energies into this. Hmm. Uh, That's gross, huh? from what I have heard so far. Um, you know, as far as I try to be over from it, from what we have discussed in the first half and try to be practical in this half in, in, our, in, in our discussion, but the situation itself, go back and pinpoint really because what unveils what unfolds is really it's deadlocked in, as you say now even if these people who have the back the support of most of the african people uh, are willing to come in as you say they need to be approved by the regional blocks so again if the door is shut there's no way for them to come in so you know let's go back and discuss what we have been discussing before there are three figures okay let's uh, I, help me to unpuzzle this there is the african union there is uh, the current uh, chairman of the year uh, south africa president ramaphosa and then there is france okay the, it's like a big elephant in the room what is the triangle between all like in 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 these three what made the uh, uh, Musafaki, you know, to, to write a letter or to, to pick that call and say uh, to fire uh, to Dr. Arikana from her position. But definitely, I am assuming uh, French is, uh, the, the French are behind it. What do they mean? What, what is this? Can you try to help me to unpuzzle this for me and for all other viewers? We are with you. Okay, my uh, basically, all that I can say is that from our perspective, uh, we don't have all the answers. But from the fallout, we know that France definitely has, you know, a deeper interest in Africa than we all expected. And we do not think that that deep interest in Africa is actually, you know, to the benefit of this continent. For us, that is the, the only consideration. Yes, we believe in opening up to, you know, other superpowers that have interest in Africa, but then it should be to our benefit as Africans. What France is doing, of course, we all know what the Arikana expose was all about. So we cannot say that she spoke, you know, against France for something that France was doing very well or good to the benefit of Africa in any way. So without going into much details, we can mm -hmm. all imagine why France is still bent on keeping Faki Mahamat, you know, as the leader of the African Union Commission. But what we also want to say, and the reason we're making, you know, global appeals, is we believe that now we can also reach out to other superpowers of the West, of the East, wherever. Let them also take a look at what is happening in Africa. Why, why should all of them sit back and allow France to plunder this continent of Africa in this way? When we have the European Union that can rise up and tell France, hey, 
look, you cannot continue to do what you're doing in Africa because it is not in, in anybody's interest. Why should the United States of America, you know, sit up and watch what is going on and not say anything? Why should China keep quiet? We are going to make a lot of noise until all these people hear about us and, and come in and want to help us to stand on our feet. But isn't that what we are trying also to avoid on the other hand for foreign powers not to interfere in the issues of Africa, in, in African issues? Uh, and then now again, we are crying to them for, uh, for, for their support while we failed to put our house in order. You see, when, when in the situation that we are in now, we have a superpower that is beating us up right here in our homes and keeping us also from crying. If you don't cry out for the others to also, you know, hear you, you don't get anywhere. We 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 don't seem to have all the answers against what is Francis what France is doing against us. Okay, so what we my organization, what we are saying is that we want to cry on to the point where the whole world, because it's a global world, the global the world is a global village now. Yeah. And we want to cry to that point where the other superpowers also hear our cry and pay attention to what is happening. We're not saying that we're going into a state of neocolonialism for you know for all these superpowers to come and plunder Africa and share you know, the loot and go away. We are saying that with the tenets of democracy and good governance and everything that is being thrown to the dogs here in Africa, we want Africa to be re-liberated. And we want those that care about Africa to arise up and, and help us to, to, to get out of this situation. And I think it is a legitimate call, exactly. you know, to those that, to those that, you know, want to hear us to know what is happening to us and to extend the hand of assistance and help to us for us to get out of this, you know, uh, a choke from France. Hmm. Yes, we do not give up on the African Union, which is the only and biggest uh, Pan-African organization that we have in the continent until those values that our uh, founding fathers had established for what they established it for is fulfilled. We don't give up, we will give our support. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for what you are doing on behalf of the African people, really bringing this, uh, to give it a voice and bringing it to the globally, like really thank you very much. And uh, one last question, is there any role for the African diaspora into this? What do you want to say for the viewers as well? I, I, I give you the floor before we conclude. Yes, the diaspora, we all know, is the sixth region of Africa. We have a lot of uh, plans to involve the diaspora in our activities. We have a lot of uh, things uh, on the table that, you know, for security reasons, we cannot disclose at the moment. But we want all our brothers and sisters uh, from Cambodia to Jamaica to, you know, everywhere to know that we are standing with them and they have to stand with us in this most trying time of African liberation because the battle continues and just as you know 50 something years ago it started with Kwame Nkrumah and the lives it is still continuing now and we want all of them to identify with us and help us be with us through the struggle because it is the right struggle for African liberation and African liberty you know on a different level altogether it is uh, a situation now that calls for all Africans and people of African descent to come together and take us through this because that is what God himself, you know, wants for this continent of Africa to enjoy and to be emancipated. Hmm. Thank you very much. That was really very an enlightening discussion that we had with uh, Advocate Sarko Abebrese. Thank you very much for your time. I am very happy to have you here and I'm very sure that we will meet again and uh, to let us uh, the updates 
uh, on what's happening regarding what you are uh, doing now and also other uh, other issues you know here and there we all are pan-africans we want the best for this continent if not for us really our children should get the best out of it they shouldn't pass they shouldn't pass through what we we are passing through and uh, yeah thank you for your time and until next time bye bye thank you very much for having me thank you that was it for us for today i hope you enjoyed and you learned something from this discussion if you like this video and learned something from it then spread the word share it to the people your friends and also if you like it give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe until next time bye bye